uh, source that is in the direction of your observation. And more exactly, uh, I can, if you can see that this is, if this is not a SK Boolean uh, model of the energy momentum tensor, I can write it in terms of two integrals of a right and move a right and left converse. And then uh, this integral, since I'm here, uh, is over the, over the whole source, it has this uh, exponent. Now the interesting feature about that crossing of the two curves that where the, I call, where the, speed of, the stream becomes the speed of light is that if now I'm looking at very high frequencies, then generally I expect this integral to go very fast and not to see any gravity there. But if you are at that particular point or close to that, you are close to the saddle point. So if I can just, uh, if I can satisfy two saddle points for both of these exponents, that means I can get significant gravity there. And that's called the cost driven. So, so, if, so basically now if I have a cost driven I, and uh, it will emit significant uh, gravity wave in particular direction of its full, uh, in that direction of the cost. However, it's very unlikely for observer to see exactly along the, uh, that particular direction. So in general, you want somewhere maybe not exactly close to that direction. And so maybe here the government is that a, a contribution around the saddle point is something like this. So uh, it, it comes from, it, it, it starts to get up from, from the, not exactly the saddle point, but around it. And that helps us because uh, if, even if you're not exactly at the saddle point, you can get some. Uh, you can get uh, signal. So basically, what I what I have to be interested in is, uh, is that if my cost form, if my cosmic stream forms a cost, and this cost is in certain, uh, anything, uh, the cost is in certain direction n, then what would be the gravity wave emission in this other around this uh, direction? And I define a cone, the uh, beaming cone, the take theta, and calculate the. Uh, a signal uh, amplitude of the gravity wave in that form. And it turns out in fact uh, this theta depends on what frequency you are looking at and you, you get some um, some heat uh, function which if you are inside this for any uh, frequency you can define how narrow uh, this cone is going to be <coughs> and if you are inside that you get a signal which goes at one over uh, f to the one third and if you are outside it, you get a very fast decay. And so the, the higher and higher frequencies I go, the cone will be narrower and narrower. So you have to use shorter. So and then people put everything together as the more and uh, so now because in reality what we want to go to observe is an mathematical setting. Uh, you need to put in the, the different components of the cosmology, rich effects, uh, care background. Uh, now you have a network of a stream, which it tells you what the loop size of the cosmic strings are going to be, and each of the people usually estimate through uh, simulations and numerical calculations. And in the end, during that, you can calculate the rate of the uh, rate of the cost events that one expects to observe, for example, at, the, at experiments like LIGO. So here, for example, for different GMU, the tension of the stream, you can say, and, uh, what if I want to see one event per year, uh, what is the chance of seeing different uh, amplitudes? And I think these are the LIGO and the plasma. Now, we wanted to go one step, uh, one step further and say, so does that picture hold it now? Uh, we have other dimensions in the picture, extra dimensions. What will change in general? And as a toy model, the first thing you, uh, we added was that, okay, now my position is not anymore the three plus one, but my, my half in the extra dimensions. And so now my left movers and right movers have become this picture with higher dimensional components. I still have this condition, but for the high 
high dimensional vector that they both have to lie on some unitary, unitary however, higher dimensional uh, sphere. And then the subtlety is that unlike before where the curve would generally cross each other and give me cost event in every period of the string, now one dimensional curve will not generally cross each other on the surface of these higher dimensional spheres. So then probability of having an exact cost would, must go to zero. So however, as I said earlier, it's not really important that I have exact cost. So we said, uh, what if I, I get a signal just when the two get, get close enough to each other that I can have something close to the saddle point. And, what is the, then, and then I calculate the probability of getting that close and uh, and then integrate over the uh, signal. And so basically what we did was that I assumed that the minimum, if we uh, represent the minimum distance between two weak vectors, as delta of the delta equal to zero would be the exact cost. Now what is the probability for having delta? And then we have the argument that say, no, how many uh, equations we have, how many constraints we have. So if we are getting away from the exact cost, what would be the, how the probability changes? And uh, if you say, okay, now I have uh, n plus three equations, one constraint, and I have two sigma plus and sigma minus that are moving, then the probability has to go as delta to number of extra dimension. Which if n was zero in three plus one, that could mean the probability was one. But now if n is higher dimension, then the probability increases. But then we said, okay, this is a naive picture we are allowing for uh, A prime and B prime to be completely independent of what is going on in physics. Maybe there are some uh, constraints that we don't see, for example, because the strings are not exactly number strings, but some, they have some finite size, and you have some the, uh, extra dimension. It's not also infinite, it has a finite size. Then those corrections will limit the value of uh, uh, they, they always make you to get to some close value. You cannot get uh, very far. And say what the top things change. So now, if, uh, what happened is that I'm looking at the same event that I had in 3 plus 1, but instead of uh, defining this new parameter, delta, makes me to get away a little bit uh, from the exact cost. And that means that uh, the, the cone that I defined before that I could make the observation is effectively getting uh, smaller and narrower. So I can basically bring the, if I have a cost four, I have to look into a narrower cone. So here we have explicit solution to R to justify whether we are making the right assumption by looking at a specific loop uh, solution that you have harmonics of left moving and right moving. And the interesting thing is, I guess, before, for example, for these solutions, I had uh, a number of vectors that I was allowed to have the extra harmonics to oscillate them. Always I had three orthogonal vectors, but now with additional vectors, I'm allowing the string to be able to oscillate in the other direction, and that makes it possible deviate uh, the, uh, from the 3D picture. And, um, and in this particular model, just for this, uh, this example, we couldn't see any, uh, any constraint on the value of delta. Anyway, so, probably, so we haven't uh, taken into account any warping of the space time dimension that could change the picture. And as I said, so probably some finite y with correction should uh, correct the normal description. And uh, if, for example, the width versus the radius is very, uh, radius of the extra dimension is getting very large, then it shouldn't care about the extra dimension and not be able to oscillate in that direction. But giving all that, if uh, I just simplify my toy model by adding, taking this, for example, correction as sort of a Upper, upper bound on delta, then I can calculate the event, uh, take, uh, everything as if 
into incorporating the new event phase for cost. and then see how do things change. So this is the uh, original <coughs> plot that I showed you in 3D. Uh, here the dotted lines are if uh, we have like a, we are doing the interpolating, uh, the, uh, the original plot we're using some interpolating function, we are doing exact interpolation. But then, so just naively adding simply the number of dimension and changing the probability goes from the more you add, the less signal you get. But uh, then if I add... Yeah, I cannot read the axis there. What is this? This is the amplitude. How big? What is the value? It's around 10 to the minus 23. It's a light or something. So these are made optimally for like 150 hertz or one light one. And this one is the... If, uh, so now in terms of the event rate, if I'm looking at different number of extra dimensions, then the event rate, for example, goes uh, higher or lower. Uh, yeah, the, higher, the, uh, the more number of extra dimensions you have, the lower number of rates. Now, if I add this additional delta now as the upper bound, then uh, for a specific delta not, then you can see then uh, obviously uh, this is a 3D. Then I can change them to extra dimensions. And this one is when I have uh, 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 fixed the number of these dimensions, but instead change the delta naught. And if delta naught goes to zero, I have to get back the, um, the original 3D. Okay.
Well, it's absolutely great to be back uh, once again at CETA. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, some work I finished up a little while ago. Um, so, I don't have to tell uh, this audience uh, that it's exciting that we have the dark sector, that we have this other 96% we don't understand uh, exactly what uh, the laws of uh, physics uh, for. And in my opinion, this is undeniable evidence for new particles, new forces, something beyond um, what we know about. And that's you know, why I got into uh, to, to working in physics. Um, so, but I call this the dark sector. And of course, what I really mean when I talk about the dark sector is that we're not enlightened about the physics of the dark sector. We're living in the dark ages of the dark sector right now. Okay, so it's important to, uh, to sort of step back and look at what do we really know about what's going on in, uh, in terms of dark matter and dark energy uh, and what's possible. So you know, one question you can ask uh, when, when you're thinking about the dark sector is how do we see the dark sector? How do we get at it? And of course, you know, we have all these wonderful observations of uh, the CMB in 21 centimeters uh, in the future, perhaps, large scale structure, supernova, etc. And, uh, you know, this is, this, this is how we, the universe communicates what's going on in the dark sector to us. That's not what I really mean. What I mean, since I'm a theorist, is how do we see the dark sector? Okay, so we see the dark sector, if I write down the action for the universe, here. We've got the light sector, has a standard model, everything we know about. Um, we have some dark sector, which we know has to be there. We know there has to be some, some, some dark matter uh, physics going on. We might have some interactions that, that, that uh, directly couple the standard model to this dark sector. And uh, at minimum, we have some kind of gravitational coupling um, that's, that's universal in at least in the context of general relativity. And so really, we have these two pathways to get to the dark side, right? So we could have non-gravitational signatures that connect us directly uh, up top, and then indirectly, we can go through this, this lower route, and it's what I like to call gravitationally mediated signatures of dark sector physics. Okay, so, uh, that's that's how we know about what's going on in the dark sector. You know, something wiggles in the dark sector, we see the gravitational effects of that in the standard model plasma. So, now, what do we actually know? I'm going to focus in on dark matter now. What do we know about dark matter, um, you know, as as of today? Well, remarkably, right? We, you know, we know the from the CMD, we know the abundance of dark matter. Um, from observations of large-scale structure, the matter-power spectrum, we know that there's not too much free, free streaming in, in, of the dark matter particles in the early universe. They don't uh, move too far because that would erase the small-scale structure in the, the matter-power spectrum. We don't see that. And this is a picture of the bullet cluster. And, we, and, and it, it, what, what we see here is a map of the the dark matter density and the X-ray luminosity, and we see that the dark matter has passed through each other. Uh, when these two clusters collided, the dark matter passed through each other, whereas the baryons got stuck in the middle. That's evidence that's, that's a bound on self-interaction. It tells us that the self-interaction cross-section of dark matter should roughly be um, at least a thousand times smaller than, say, the Thomson cross-section divided by the mass of the electron in terms of cross-section per unit mass. So these, these are, you know, uh, real constraints that put constraints on the physics of the dark sector no matter what it is. You know, these are, these are real things we, we need to worry about. Now, of course, uh, we have candidates. People have been thinking about dark matter for a long time now. And the, you know, the canonical uh, uh, favorite candidate is the WIMP. And, and the WIMP 
is, is able to satisfy these three constraints. So we can satisfy the relative but is appropriate because we have this parameter, the, the total annihilation cross-section of the WIMP, we can fiddle around with until we, 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 can, we get the, the, the right amount of dark matter of, of around uh, omega uh, a squared of 0.1. It's very cool when it freezes out, so it, it doesn't freeze straight too much. And, it, and you know, in, in, in these typical models, this cross-section is sort of the weak scale you know, so we don't have we don't have too much self interaction. Wimps are great candidates for dark matter, and I don't want you, anyone to to uh, get me wrong. I like wimps. I work on wimp models as well. Uh, but I, I also you know like to think of alternatives to uh, the standard measure. Okay, so let's let's take a, a short aside for a second and think about something we know is is not dark matter. So. Standard model neutrinos are not dark matter. Okay, they're not dark matter because they freeze out uh, the interactions. The weak interactions freeze out when they're ultra relativistic uh, compared, you know, the, the temperature large compared to the mass. And the difference between neutrinos and WIMPs is that this fixes the number density to be some uh, large value compared to, the, say, the number of uh, neutrally known in, in a supersymmetric model. And so with this fixed number density, if you know the energy density, that tells you what mass you need to get a, a, a certain energy density. And if you, if you don't just think about neutrinos, if you think about any relativistic, say, fermion, in order to do this calculation, in order to get this density of stop in the universe, and, and, and say the thing throws out before the GCD phase transition, you need a mass of 50 electron volts. Standard model neutrinos freeze out after the GCD phase transition, you need an even lower mass. And so if you combine this with the Tremaine gun bound, which tells us that the coarse grain phase space density must be less than the maximum of the fine grain space 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 density, then back in, in 79, this told us. 100 EV fermions can't act as dark matter, so you can't get the relative abundance. Furthermore, these things are relativistic when they freeze out. They freeze stream for a very large distance, and so they freeze stream too much. They cannot be dark matter. So in our little score, score sheet here, uh, they get uh, one out of three, they fail, and they cannot be dark matter. So why did this happen? This happened because we didn't have enough freedom to fit the data, right? So can we fix this? You know, I'm, a, I'm a theorist. I'm sure, I can fix this. I need to, you know, change change my my paradigm a little bit in order to be able to accommodate the observations. So how am I going to do this? Well, I'm going to use my eraser, and I'm going to get rid of connections between the visible sector. And I'm going to rename the dark sector the hidden sector. Okay, so now I'm imagining I've got some some ultra weakly interacting uh, hidden sector in terms of the interaction with the standard model. It might have its own interactions that are completely separate from the standard model, and it only talks to us through this gravitational channel. So what does that you know what does that do for us? Well, I first want to remind you that you know I'm not the only person. Thinking about the hidden sector, this is not a comprehensive list, but you know people have been recently, you know people have thought about this for, for decades, and recently people have thought about hidden sector WIMPs, hidden sector charged particles, hidden sector uh, or dark atoms, um, and what I'm talking about here are hidden sector light fermions, right? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to use these hidden sector light fermions as dark matter. So. I don't know what's I don't know what's uh, what Feynman would think about the hidden sector, but anyway, um, in terms of nanotechnology, Feynman once said that there's plenty of room at the bottom to fit things at small light scales. And what what I, what I want to do here, if you allow me, is to take the Fourier transform of Feynman, and I want to say there's plenty of room at low temperatures to fit particles at low momentum. 
Okay, so what, it, what, what does this, this do for us? Well, this, this is a fix, right? So now, we, we, we uh, if they're decoupled, we don't necessarily have to have the temperature of the hidden sector be equal to the temperature of the standard model. And we have an extra parameter to fiddle with to fit the data. If this is a low number, we can fit many degrees of freedom with potentially interesting self-interactions in physics in the hidden sector. So how can you do this? Well, I'm not going to go in detail into this, but you know, if you have different reheating efficiencies to different uh, uh, sectors, and they're never efficiently coupled, then you can end up with a situation with one part of the, part of the, the, the total uh, um, species in the universe being hotter than, than some other sector, sector of the universe that's, that's colder. Okay, so, uh, you could also do this if you had way, way more, well not way, way more, like thousands at least of degrees of freedom in the standard model sector prior to some temperature where the hidden sector and the standard model were uh, coupled, and then the standard model would relatively heat up compared to the, the hidden sector. But I think the number one is, is my preferred version. Okay, so what, what does this do for you? Well, it allows you now to play around with the number density, right? So the number density in WIMP models is decreased because you go down the exponential tail. Here I can decrease the number density just because the hidden sector is a lower temperature. And so what does that do for us? Well, if I, I know this temperature, if I know this number density, I can translate that into a mass for the particles in the hidden sector if I assume that they freeze out when they're hot, if I assume that they're something like a neutrino in the hidden sector, then I find that the mass of the particles should be 40 kV if the hidden sector is an order of magnitude colder than the standard model sector. Okay, so just, just to be absolutely clear, uh, the requirements for, for this, this using hidden hot dark matter as cold dark matter is that you have relative to freeze out but it's non-relativistic today, so it's cold heat, okay? Uh, and if you do this, you can get the abundance, because these particles are, you know, heavier, uh, the free streaming length is less, they're, they're basically, you know, they're warm or cold dark matter, depending on what part of the parameter space you're in, and they, couldn't, they can have small cell interactions, so you, you pass muster with all these uh, observational tests. So, you know, there's many options you could have for, for the, these, thing, these things. I'm just talking, I'm just putting this out there as another idea that people should maybe be thinking about if they're thinking about hidden sector theories. So the prototypical hot dark matter was, was uh, a neutrino, which, you know, for, for me wrote down the four fermion interactions. For me, it was a smart guy. I'm, I'm going to, so let's just imagine I, I take a copy of the uh, uh, neutrinos or, or some, some other effective theory with four fermion interactions and say it has a different strength. Okay, so if I, if I do that, what, you know, is there a region of the parameter space where I can get this scenario realized? So the answer is yes. So what I plotted here, this is the effective coupling in this theory, this is the mass, and indeed is if you go, this, uh, up here, this is the ratio of temperatures. If you go above, or if you go below a ratio of one, then you start to find a region where you can satisfy all these conditions. I'm most interested in this region down here. This is the lower mass side where you get sort of warmish dark matter. You get constraints from, from large scale structure. Now, you know, so this, this, this is another way to get all the dark matter in the universe, but you know, and say, oh yeah, but you know, you have to introduce this whole extra hidden sector. You know, what's what is good? What is it good for? Um, I would claim that potentially not absolutely nothing. Um, if you, I don't know if you get that reference, but um, <laughs> I do. Okay. Good. Um, so one possibility that's kind of interesting that we've been thinking about recently. I've been thinking about people with. with uh, Human, Davuzzi, David Morrissey, Sean Cohen, is uh, we're working on a model where we can sequester a net antibaryon number 
in the hidden sector because it's some cold plasma. And uh, so that will give a connection between baryogenesis and dark matter density. And then very quickly, uh, because uh, I'm running out of time, another possibility is that, you know, in this scenario, the, the dark matter density is dominated by the particle that's stable and has, has the biggest mass. So if you have other particles that are stable and lighter, they will give us a signature in the matter power spectrum where you sort of get, because they have a longer free streaming length and a lower mass, you get a shelf in the matter power spectrum at some scale that could allow you to do dark matter spectroscopy in the hidden sector, even if you don't know, even if you don't have any uh, you know, direct interactions. So I'll just put my summary slide up. This is a different way that you might think about if you're building models of dark matter to get all the dark matter in the universe. It appears to us like cold dark matter or warm dark matter. And if you have extra interactions, one possibility is, is, is it might decay instead of all particles on some very, very long time scale, longer than the age of the universe. I'm working on a, a scenario to get baryogenesis out of this. And you, 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 I, I, I want to think about a little bit more about doing spectroscopy of the hidden sector with the matter power spectrum. So then we have one question, we'll mark this again. So, so on a big puzzle, so on the one hand you say that this should be very weakly covered to the final model, on the other hand you want to get by each other. So, yeah. We don't have much well, time. Well, I mean, the zero color approximation is just completely uncoupled. But you can figure out how big couplings are allowed, mm -hmm. and it's consistent. It's in the range, so you might be able to do that. You have to think about the, 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 high, the high, high scale sort of reading process. That's, that's the scale you're going to have. So we'll move on to the last talk. We're slightly behind, but actually only five minutes to the center of it. The last people will be Mark from about enhanced bulk flows and bring a new structure. Great. Uh, thank you, Neil. Thank you all for staying. I'll try to get us out of here as soon as possible so we can all have coffee. Um, so I'm talking about bulk flows, but I first have to talk about the modified gravity model that I'm going to be describing. And uh, it's a class of models that go into the name brain induced gravity sometimes. And so the idea, just to bring everyone up to speed, is that you, our four dimensional world is a membrane that lives in a, in, with large extra dimensions, infinite volume of extra dimensions. This infinite volume is the key new ingredient here. People have been thinking about adding dimensions for a really long time. But it was only with the Dwale Gavadadze Parati construction a few years ago, people figured out a way to add extra dimensions that have an infinite volume, as opposed to a finite volume or a warped finite volume. And the thing that you get out of an infinite volume in your extra dimensions is new infrared physics in gravity. And so that, you can basically break that into three phenomenological statements. One, so gravity fundamentally is not 4D, but higher dimensional. Uh, for, for what I'm going to be talking about, at least six total. And whenever you go to far enough length scales, large enough length scales, what that means is that gravity starts getting weaker because the gravitational force, or the gravitational potential in 4D is one over R for, uh, for a local localized source. As you add more dimensions, that gravitational potential weakens. So 5D goes to one over R squared. 60 goes to one of our Q, et cetera. And so that allows you to have a very weak infrared physics for gravity, which is going to allow you to address potentially the cosmological constant problem. Uh, because the cosmological constant is the ultimate uh, low energy source for gravity in the sense of being the, the zero mode of the energy density uh, in the universe. Now, so if you just postulate that, what you find is that, well, the first thing question you want to ask is, what about the four dimensional physics? We know that the universe that we usually see is not higher dimensional. And so it turns out that it, it's fine as you start to come down to sort of more normal length scales. So if you put your extra dimensional crossover scale at something like the horizon, then as you come down to smaller length scales, say hundreds of megaparsecs, you go back to a four dimensional effective theory that looks like general relativity plus a scalar field. Now everybody says, well, I've learned about that ever since I was a kid. It's brain sticky. That's really highly constrained. And 
That's not quite true here. So you do get one thing that just looks like regular old scalar tensor, and that is you have an extra scalar force. And so gravity is stronger on intermediate length scales, shorter than the crossover scale, but outside of this uh, Einstein scale I'm about to tell you about, where gravity returns to GR. And so the, phenomenolo the phenomenolo phenomenology you get for cosmology is that of an enhanced gravitational force, so a larger effective gene. And so I've already hinted that the key thing that makes this interesting is that without any work or without any fine-tuning of parameters or specially chosen potential, the extrascalar force that comes out of these theories gives you uh, has large self-interactions. And these large self-interactions turn off the extra force near nearby uh, dense sources. So if you have anything that's high density, then nearby that, you're going to go back to just GR. So the solar system tests are all passed with flying colors without having to work at all. And that's the really remarkable bit of phenomenology here, is that you have a new theory of gravity, gives you new phenomenology, and it passes all of your current tests without having to work hard. And so that's cool by itself. And then as I, as I indicated, it, the fact that the idea of having large, these infinite extra dimensions may also give you a way of addressing the cosmological concept problem. And so, you can choose your uh, poison. You can either think about this as a way of uh, dealing with dark energy, and say that take the phenomenology for free, or you can say, wow, that's really cool phenomenology, and leave the dark energy for uh, people to worry about that. So, um, I'm going to be talking about bulk flows for the most part, um, but I don't have a whole lot of time. So I'm just going to focus on the linear theory. There's a whole nonlinear story that's complicated here. But just to give you a, a, a basic indication, so there's an extra scalar force. And so that modifies the linear evolution of density perturbations in this way. So this is just like normal with a renormalization of G Newton. And there's a density dependence that goes approximately like this. So that is, the more dimensions you have, the stronger the force gets. And that's because this extra force is related to the fact that our four-dimensional membrane can wobble into these extra dimensions. So the more ways to wobble, the more power, the more strength of the gravitational force, it turns out. And there's also this beta factor, and this is where the RC crossover scale comes in, because that basically tells you where your force turns on. Because this Weinstein effect that turns off the force in areas of high density also turns off the force at early times. And so the early universe is fine, no modifications here. And so what you have is a basic history of the universe that looks like this, in three colors. General relativity in early times, extra growth at late times on intermediate length scales, and then some suppression of gravitational forces on very long length scales. Basically where you only have, and the only game in town is the ISW and uh, dark energy. And that's, a, that's another story. But I'm going to be focusing on this extra growth. And what, it does, and what it tells you about the development of structure. And so, I mean, the, the obvious thing is that it's going to beef up structure formation. Gravity is stronger, more things come together, right? And so, the, then you want to say, well, we've, you know, we've, been, we've been looking at stuff in the universe for a really long time. We have an idea about how much structure there is. It's not that, it's not that precise of an idea, not compared to, say, CME physics, where we have, you know, really percent level accuracy now. And so what you can say is that, if I assume that my early universe is just standard vanilla uh, lambda CDM, which is perfectly fine in this model, and so our primordial normalization of the uh, uh, power spectrum with W map to be something like 0.8, then we take uh, measurements today to set an upper limit for how, how much uh, amplitude the power spectrum can have. And it turns out the tightest constraint at the moment that, that is uh, sort of wide, the, the solid uh, is the, that from the X-ray cluster counts in the Rosette survey, which gives you an upper limit for sigma today of about 0.88. There's a bit of subtlety in interpreting something like cluster counts in these modified gravity models. That's something we're working on now, but you can just, as a, as a first pass, you can take this as your constraint. And then what that gives you is, for a fixed number of dimensions, a, a minimum value of the crossover radius that's allowed. So larger values of the crossover radius make, mean the effect is less, and lower values of the crossover radius mean the effect is too large. And so the one I'm going to be focusing on for my phenomenology is the d equals 10 case, where the crossover radius is about 3 gigaparsecs. All right, so I have two observational tests to tell you about. One you heard about yesterday, for some of you at least, from Ian Bellman. 
Could be a very nice talk on this. Um, and actually, two thirds of the authors are in, are in the room. Um, <laughs> my cousin. So if you have any complaints about this observation, direct them to them later. <laughs> but the, the basic idea is that by using peculiar velocity surveys in the local universe, by local I mean the nearest hundred or so megaparsecs, you could use that those data to figure out about how fast the sphere of stuff around us is moving relative to the CMB. And that's because that's a sort of a hundred megaparsec scale thing, it should be governed by linear perturbation theory. And it is. Um, you can test we can test that in uh, in body simulations and we did. And so this is a safe linear calculation. So you can get a prediction for what the variance in standard gravity should be on those X scales. And for the parameters that we were using in our paper, that's about 180 kilometers per second on these on the 50 megaparsec next scales. But the actual observation you gives you a velocity of 400 mega, uh, kilometers per second at that wind scale. And so that looks like an anomaly and a bit of a discrepancy. Um, and so we're, we're moving too fast. And uh, so then the question becomes, how much more likely is it to be moving this fast in a modified gravity model as compared to GR with lambda CDM uh, parameters? And so that was the, one of the calculations we did. And so it's pretty straightforward, basically just uh, it's, it's not that hard to do these calculations, and you just have stronger gravity now. You're moving a lot, things are moving faster now. You get an enhance of about 30 to 40 percent in peculiar velocities today. And so you can just do a simple chi squared test comparing the two models. And what you find is a delta chi squared for these three data points, because remember there's only three directions that we can be moving. And so there's only three data points for the local universe. And you, for those three, you get a delta chi squared of like 4.6 in favor of the gravity, modified gravity model. It should go in favor of the stronger gravity. It's not a huge effect, but you know this is only one measurement. And the, the, the field really of, of really understanding peculiar velocities is just, just starting now. I mean, we have tons of peculiar velocity measurements in galaxy surveys, but the only one we can really nail down is this is one of the first that we can really nail down and say, okay, this is a real bulk flow. Let's look at the data. So this is just the start. So. Um, I would, I would call it interesting, but not, you know, it's not a slam dunk. So the last thing I'm going to tell you about um, is something that Chris also mentioned for another reason, and which doesn't really, you wouldn't usually think of in a talk on peculiar velocities, and that is the bullet cluster. So let me just remind you, uh, the bullet cluster is this uh, beautiful system that has, has undergone a merger before we looked at it. Um, and the blue false color here is the where we think the dark matter is because of the weak lensing that we can see from the background. And then the red stuff is the hot gas that's emitting X-rays. And of course, this is the poster child for dark matter. Yeah, dark matter works, look, they don't line up, right? So all of the, the stuff that's doing the lensing is not the hot gas. And the thing that doesn't really get, uh, that, well, it hasn't really been appreciated about the bullet cluster until recently, is that even though the bullet over here that's got the nice shot for it, should be expected to be set offset from its dark matter because it's a small it's the small thing it's about one tenth the size of the central cluster so um, it, it should get its gas stripped off when it goes through a collision because it's small and the big thing it hit was big right and if I run into a sumo wrestler I'm gonna I'm gonna fall down um, but the thing is in the bullet the big ten, the big cluster which is like ten to the fifteen solar masses let me remind you that's one of the biggest objects in the universe. This huge cluster has been hit by one little cluster, and it's lost all its gas. So that is a very high energy event. And this is, and this is not focused on very much, because the bullet's so cool and so nice. But it takes a whole lot of energy to knock that gas out. And so whenever, you, whenever people try to start doing pressure simulations to say, well, how much energy does it take? What they say is that it's an initial velocity of about 3,000 kilometers per second. When you start the simulation, whenever the bullet is way over here, at the variable radius for this cluster. And so then, so 3,000, I don't know what that means, naively. But if you, then you can look in, so you can either do a back of the calculation and say, what's, if you started the bullet at rest and just threw it in, how fast would it be going when it hit? Or you can do a lot of hard work like Ryan Komatsu did and go look at horizon scale in body simulations and calculate how fast uh, these kind of collisions take, uh, are going for lambda CDM type parameters. You get the same answer either way. One way you take half your life, the other way you, uh, <laughs> spend, five, you spend 10 minutes in the back of the envelope. And the answer is that the typical velocity 
is like uh, a little over a thousand kilometers per second. It's not very fast. Um, and so if you try to get a distribution on that, you find that the probability of these bullet, a bullet cluster-like collision, just looking at this naively, is something like 10 to the minus 10 in lambda z. Um, that's really way out in the, uh, in the wings of the distribution, so you don't have to take that probability seriously. But the point is, it's just not likely. In their horizon scale simulations, they found zero such events. Um, and so then you can just repeat the, if you can do the back of the envelope calculation quickly, and you can see that it reproduces the standard gravity results very well. And then you can um, estimate the, the improvement of the probability. And because you're in the wings of the distribution, a little bit of an increase. These aren't super fast mean velocities in the, in the brain, brain induced gravity model. But they're enough so that you get a 10 to the 4 enhancement in probability, taking their standard uh, statistics. And so what that kind of tells you is that you're going in the right direction. I mean, you can argue, you can quibble about um, have you gone far enough in the right direction. And there may be other nonlinear effects in play. But this is uh, certainly something that I think should deserve a little bit more, more thought. Uh, and that's an interesting point. That another place where velocity flows are higher uh, than you expect. So just to summarize, um, so I, I hope, well, I, I've attempted to convince you that it's worth thinking about infinite volume of extra dimensions. They give you a very interesting class of modified gravity models. There's a, a, a new phenomenology that's very, it's perfect for cosmology because you don't have to screw around the solar system tests. And you get new uh, gravitational physics on the, so that's exactly the scales we're studying now, which is intercluster scale. And that's a stronger gravitational force. And that leads to stronger, faster bulk flows because faster bulk flows are exactly what you need to make structure grow and build up. And in the couple of cases where we have good measurements today, the anomalies that are seen are alleviated, if not fully explained, by the brain induced gravity. I think I have 30 more seconds, so I can go on to my, my, extra, my bonus side, which is to say <laughs> um, that if, if you, I mean, if, you, if you're, it's all involved with actual observations, the thing that you were going to ask, the question you were going to ask is, well, what about redshift space distortion? Because as I indicated previously in passing, we, you know, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is like zillions of redshifts for galaxies. And so in, people have spent years of their lives figuring out how to, to go back from like all the redshift space distorted um, galaxies. Redshift space distortion, for those of you who don't know, is just the fact that stuff is falling towards this, all galaxies are falling towards something else. And so if you want to figure out their intrinsic cross correlation, you have to take out those velocities to do the statistics. And the point is that we have a tremendous amount of information about how things are falling together in all of, in the surveys already. And the only problem with that is you don't know anything about, you don't know that much about bias, so exactly how the galaxies are tracing the matter. And if you want to start looking at a modified gravity model, then you have to really get into the, the, the details of the scalar density dependence to really nail down which prediction is. But this is the future, and that's what we're going for. Thank you very much. Right, so there's two, so there's two points there, let me just remind you. So the initial, the thing that got brain induced gravity famous is the PGP model. Its initial hope was to produce self-accelerating solutions that is, the universe is ex ex accelerated without putting in dark energy. Those have ghosts, no question. This is, that's not what we're using here. We're trying to, we're putting in dark energy and saying that we can solve that problem. The superluminality question is still, I would say, an open question. So the one place where you can really precisely study it is PGP. The PGP model seems to have some problems. Um, in, the, in the ones that people have studied. It's a, it's a larger class of models than that, and so the, the point there is that because essentially whenever you look at the perturbations of these models, you see superluminal propagating modes, and that tells you that you can't construct a good S matrix in, in, the, in the UV. And that would be, a, if, you, if that persists, that would be a serious problem. However, it's, uh, it's not quite open and shut. That's always going to show up whenever you have higher dimensions. So, so some classes of these models already have been ruled out by SW, so what, what is your model? Uh, oh, right, so that's, it's a subtlety because, the, so whenever you go past one at large infinite extra dimension, doing the perturbations at horizon scales becomes, uh, we don't have a good theory for it, a really good theory for it as yet. So we, have a, we can trust our effective field theory, 
this is sort of an inverse where you're, you're having an effective theory that you can trust as you get on short length scales, so that it gets harder on long length scales. Um, so the, the basic idea is that you're going to have a, a fight on those length scales because for ISW, because gravity is stronger, and so that's going to push, that's going to make, uh, um, so long length scales, uh, you have dark energy, which is going to be shallowing potentials, right, or, or all of these new physics, the weakening physics, which is shallowing potentials, and that's usually what boosts your ISW. You also have stronger gravity on the, at the cluster scale, which is going to be deepening potentials. So those, all, those generically will fight each other. Uh, the hope will be that the, the large length scale weakening is not going to feed back so much that you get a bad ISW signal, but you are helped by the fact that stronger gravity on the intermediate scales fights against that sort of tugging in the long way. Why don't we continue the rest of the